Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about spectral clustering. Recall we talked about k-means last time. k-means is a method that minimizes within clusters sum of squares. So if you have unlabeled data, it tries to form clusters such that the sum of square error from the centroid of those clusters is minimized. k-means usually starts with a random initialization. Here we've initialized to three random centroids, and then points are assigned to the nearest centroid. Um, now these centroids are not the final answer because we repeat these two steps until convergence. We move the centroids to the middle of the assigned points, then we recompute the uh, membership to the centroids of the other points and we keep repeating these steps until it converges. Here's an illustration of 10 steps of k-means on three Gaussians. So these are blobs that are normally distributed that were synthetically generated. And even though we initialized our cluster centroids to these three points, eventually the iterations adjust the centroids and the cluster membership so that you get convergence. And you get the centers being this, the mean of the Gaussians and the cluster memberships being the points that were generated around the mean. However, k-means is not a free lunch. Because we had such an ideal case for k-means, it converged to what you would intuitively expect. However, if the k was not chosen correctly, then you might not get the, the right separation between your clusters. If your data is not distributed normally around the mean like it was in that um, Gaussian test case, then you might get clusters that are cutting these ellipsoids or go across two different separations in the data. Another kind of implicit assumption in k-means is that all clusters have roughly the same variance. If that's not the case and some clusters are much more densely packed than others, Again, k-means can kind of mess up and try to find even variance clusters. Finally, k-means prefers clusters to have the same number of points. So in unevenly sized blobs, it will try to assign um, additional points to particular centroids. Um, in addition, k-means is, of course, sensitive to initialization as any greedy method is, but it's also very sensitive to outliers. Um, some of these can, problems can be fixed. For example, a fairly simple one to fix is the sensitivity to outliers. You can run something called k-medioids that's a little bit less sensitive to outliers. But actually, one of the solutions to the rest of these problems is to turn your data into graphs and look at the spectra of these graphs. So if you recall how to turn your data into a graph, you first compute distances between your data points. And then you can turn those into an affinity by passing that distance through a kernel, such as a Gaussian kernel. And then you get a weighted graph that more heavily weights near neighbors and um, more sparsely weights distant points. So from that kind of graph, you have several matrices defined. So first is the affinity or adjacency matrix, which is the matrix that results here by passing distances through affinity. Or if you have graph structured data, you already have the adjacency. And there's the degree matrix. That is the sum of every row. It's the sum of the adjacencies of every single data point. And you have a graph Laplacian. Here I'm showing the unnormalized Laplacian, which is the degree minus the adjacency. And finally, we recall that the graph Laplacian can be eigen decomposed into eigenvectors u and eigenvalues um, lambda, and this is a matrix whose columns contain the eigenvectors, and whose um, and this is a matrix whose column whose diagonal contains the eigenvalues, and u transpose is just the inverse of u. This kind of eigen decomposition is interesting because we showed in previous lectures that the eigenvectors form frequency harmonics on the graph, and therefore they are called the graph spectra. And spectral clustering refers to operating in this different representation of the data. So we had the original representation of the data in terms of the original coordinates of the data points. 
And now we have an alternative representation of the data in terms of the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. This representation is also called a Laplacian eigenmath representation. Now, the graph Laplacian has very cool properties that will already lead you to believe that it's actually a very good candidate for clustering. If you look at the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian, the second smallest eigenvalue, the eigenvalue that's the first one that's not zero, it's called the Fiedler value. And the corresponding vector is called the Fiedler vector. The Fiedler value approximates the minimum cut that's needed to partition the graph into further components. So it's been shown that this vector can be used for partitioning. Um, so here's an illustration of the Fiedler vector on this graph. Here I think it's pretty easy to see that you can um, end up with an even partition of the graph with just one cut. And the way you would go about doing it is you look at the value of the Fiedler vector. Um, and you pick a threshold in that value and you get one half of your graph in one partition and the other half of your graph in another partition using a minimum cut criteria. Some of the other eigenvalues are very interesting too. Watch what happens when we take this empty graph and start filling it in. The number of zero eigenvalues is steadily decreasing. That's because the multiplicity of the zero eigenvalue indicates the number of connected components in the graph. So you already have two eigenvalues that are very interesting. The zero eigenvalue, whose multiplicity can tell you the number of connected components. And the Fiedler value, which tells you the minimum cut of the graph. In fact, you can also look at it further down eigenvalues to glean more information about clustering of the graph. Remember, one of the problems with k-means clustering was we weren't quite sure how many clusters to choose. Spectral clustering offers a potential solution to that because you can look at the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian and look for a gap. And this is called an eigengap. You see that in this graph, there is a gap between the fourth and the fifth values, i.e. the eigenvalue suddenly jumps. This actually indicates that there are roughly four clusters in this graph, but this is sort of a heuristic. A more um, serious and meaningful way that spectral clustering improves over k-means is because the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian are sensitive to connections in this graph rather than the Euclidean distance between data points. So what that means is they tend to put these points that have connections or that are densely connected in a graph together into the same clusters. And you can see that when you look at these eigenvectors. So this is a, the first non-trivial eigenvector of this graph. Notice that these points are generated unevenly. Um, this cluster in specific has a lot fewer points, but still the first eigenvector cleanly picks this cluster out. The second eigenvector cleanly picks the second cluster out. And you can see that even very small outlier clusters are picked out by further eigenvectors. So these eigenvectors, kind of breaking them or partitioning them, is a natural means by which you can cluster any graph. In spectral clustering, what we do is we simply apply k-means, but on these eigenvector representations of the graph. Here you see these eigenvector representations of these data points in just three dimensions. When you color it by cluster identity, you see that eigenvector 2 separates the green from the blue cluster, whereas eigenvector 1 separates the orange from the rest of the clusters. And so this separation is what allows k-means to come up with reasonable clusters if you look at this spectral representation. So spectral k-means actually gives you a very reasonable solution, even though we've violated some of the assumptions under which k-means performs really well. Here are the spectra of additional graphs. Um, you see that as the eigenvector values go up, you get higher frequency components, and you see that even more clearly on a continuous graph like this Minnesota roadmap. That means that the higher frequency eigenvectors can be used to more finely partition the graph into smaller and smaller clusters. So you could actually pick the resolution of the clustering with spectral clustering. 
So just to summarize, what are some of the advantages of using the graph spectrum before you do k-means, which is a different name for spectral clustering? It's good for clusters of arbitrary shape. It's good for data that's just a graph or data that you can um, convert into a graph easily. And you only need the connectivity information. Here's a classic case that shows the real advantages. If you have these two concentric circles and you're trying to minimize variance, which is what k-means does, you will pick two clusters that look like this. They cut across the data space and they're grouping these red points together with this circle that's concentric. Whereas if you have spectral clusters, it's much more concerned with keeping these graph neighbor connections intact without cutting them. And so you get these two clusters. And so it's very carefully following the shape of the data. Finally, here's a very cute slide from Andrew Ning's original paper on spectral clustering back in, back in NERFS 2001. And you see that even though these letters have very irregular shapes, spectral clustering is able to pick them out.